Hi, welcome to Keep On Pushing TV. I am your host, Devon Harris. And yeah, man, you know what we do here. We share ideas and insights that are going to challenge you, ideas that are going to inspire you to keep on pushing and live your absolute best life. So if that's something you're interested in, even remotely, yeah, you're in the right place. So again, welcome to Keep On Pushing TV. My guest today is a Canadian roar. Uh, he has won a gold in the 2002, 2003, and the 2007 World Championships uh, for the Canadian men's eight team. He's a two-time Olympian. He competed in the Summer Olympic Games of Athens 2004, and then again in Beijing 2008, where he took home the gold. Um, as if that wasn't exceptional enough, he decided in 2013 to set off with other rows, three other rows to attempt the first ever row from mainland Africa to North America, recording it for classroom lessons in, uh, in schools across the United States and Canada. 73 days into this just over 4,000 mile transatlantic rowing expedition, the boat, the boat capsized in the Bermuda Triangle. Thankfully, they live to tell the tale. And so today, our guest is a top motivational speaker and corporate trainer. He teaches strategies and skills of leadership, high performance and perseverance. So corporate and government teams globally uh, 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 through keynotes, workshops, and online seminars. He is also an author uh, of the book, The Responsibility Ethic, 12 Strategies, exceptional people use to do the work and make success happen. I am excited, pleased to welcome my friend Adam Creek to the show. Adam, welcome to Keep On Pushing, bro. Well, it's great to be here, Devin. It is certainly a pleasure. And you know what? I am so happy that we are doing this electronically and we will not be passing the coronavirus to one another. Well, we, we could do the elbow, <laughs> elbow thing. Yeah, but yeah, it's uh, <laughs> kind of interesting, uh, you know, we talk about the responsibility ethic and yeah. what's mm -hmm. going on uh, in the world today. Um, I know we're going to talk about personal responsibility, but let's just mm -hmm. touch on that a little bit um, because this is a new phenomenon. This is just no nothing that many of us have seen in our lifetime, right? And, and you know, there are some people who are panicking and some who are not taking this, uh, you know, very seriously. What do you think our individual responsibility is in, in uh, responding to, to this thing? Well, the, the core philosophy underlying my book, The Responsibility Ethic, is about focusing on what you can control and <clears throat> paying as little attention to the things you cannot control. So I think there, you know, I can control my response, I can control my reactions, I can control my actions. So when I think of the things I can con control within the face of the uh, coronavirus pandemic, I can be calm, um, I can avoid panic, I can be mm -hmm. rational. You know, I do not need to go to the grocery store and buy 18 cases of toilet paper. Um, I can wash my hands regularly, which is a good thing. Uh, when I meet people, I can fist bump and elbow bump and, you know, take those simple precautions. Right. Uh, I can avoid public places if it's recommended by the officials. <clears throat> Another thing I can do is to think about the worst case scenario and put, you know, start walking through that in my head and realize that, you know, in worst case scenarios, you know, I'm going to be okay. You know, even if people in my family die, even if uh, people in my community die, even if everything gets shut down. Uh, right now, um, you're dealing with this too. I know in your business and my business, mm -hmm. a lot of my travel is shut down. So my revenues have, have zapped up. I've got no revenues coming in in the next two months because all com conferences are canceled. So there's a cash flow issue and that's stressful. Mm -hmm. It's stressful to have no money coming in. Um, and so you know, at the end of the day, I need to focus on what I can control and say, you know, how can I make the best of, of this situation? And, you know, I can do things like increase my marketing. I have a video series that I've been 
uh, that I just recorded. So I'm going to spend a lot of time editing that and putting it out there. I'll focus on my, my executive coaching clients <clears throat> and building that business, which is online and, uh, you know, focus on other pieces of, of my business that are more uh, resilient. And again, you know, when, when it comes down to the responsibility ethic, it's not about placing blame on other things. It's not about blaming Donald Trump, even though he, <laughs> yeah, right. or, he, he can, or he can be Chinese, a bit of a, or the Chinese, right. yeah, or the Iranians, or the Italians, or like whoever the heck we want to place the yeah. blame on. It's it's looking at us, looking in the mirror. And I know you had to do this when you know when you were training to be a bobsledder. I had to do this when I was training to be a rower and saying like it's it's up to me. You know, it is up to me and uh, I'm, you know, I'm the one who's going to make this happen. Indeed. So, yeah, you, you use uh, a couple of words that I think are really important as, as we spoke about, uh, you know, responsibility. But um, uh, ooh, I just draw a blank, you know, look, looking in the mirror and not blaming others and adapting right, was, was a word I was trying to remember. Uh, and so these, I mean, these concepts obviously apply not just to dealing with a coronavirus, but uh, any crisis that we might be facing in our lives, right? It requires a, a certain amount of acceptance that, hey, this is what's going on, um, which does not, by the way, mean resignation. And then figuring a way how, uh, how, uh, how we adapt to this new normal, as it were. Yeah, I, I love how you say that, you know, acceptance is not resignation. You're not resigning yourself to like, oh, well, um, and I'm going to keep coming back to the coronavirus because it's on the top of my <laughs> yeah, head. That yeah, it's like, yeah. you know, oh, it's the coronavirus. That means that I'm just going to stay home and eat potato chips and drink beer and uh, I'm not going to do anything. You know, mm -hmm. That's no, it's the coronavirus. Guess what? It's an opportunity to stay home, to reflect, to, to do some of the personal work you need to do. I guess there's probably renovations at your house that, you know, that unfinished piece of bathroom tile that's been sitting there for the, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> for, for the last two years because you've been too busy. Well, mm -hmm. now's the time to do it. To so get it done. Yeah. Let's get our house in order. Um, and <clears throat> It's just, it's a shift. It's a shift in mindset and staying on the boil um, in, in the different parts of our lives and you know, trying to turn every crisis into an opportunity. Indeed. Talking about getting things done, Adam, um, you know, you speak a lot about, you know, being exceptional. So my question is, you know, do people start off with this quality of being exceptional and that inspires them to go do the work to create the results or is it that they are somehow inspired to do the work and that then transforms them into an exceptional person? What, what's your take well, on it? I think it's the latter, you know, Devin. I think the, you know, and you can think back to your own personal experience, <clears throat> but I can, I can share mine. Mm -hmm. I, I grew up in, in Southwestern Ontario in this, uh, it's kind of a Midwestern Canadian town, kind of an average boring ho-hum town mm -hmm. and I had a pretty average family an average upbringing my dad sold life insurance my mom was a nurse until our we she had her third kid I was the youngest of four kids and so I was an average kid in an average town and I expected to grow up and my dream when I was a kid you won't believe this my, <laughs> my dream was to be an accountant <laughs> not a roar what's wrong no with you? <laughs> and i just have like have a boring job and that where i could ride my bike to work that was mm. what I, it's like when i grew up i want to be an accountant and ride my bike to work and that was you know people said what do you want to be when you grow up mm -hmm. and everything changed in my own personal life tra trajectory when i kept trying new things in high school and when uh when i was in grade 11 i started this sport of rowing and uh, after rowing for about a year, my coach, uh, his name was Walt, Walt Benko, he took me aside and he said, uh, you're an Olympian. You just don't know it yet. Right. And so <clears throat> there I was, I was an average kid from an average town. And I thought, I'm just an average person just wanting to live an average life. And all of a sudden, I had a mentor take me aside and say, you could be exceptional if you put in the work. 
And it was because of that seed, it was because of that intervention that, um, you know, that transformed me on a path to, you know, to pursuing greatness and pursuing excellence. And I think every single one of us, you know, we're, we naturally, you know, we naturally fall to the level of the environment we're in. We're mm -hmm. such creatures of our environment. You know, if I'm, and you know, if I'm living in a certain place or I'm born into a certain family or I'm born into a certain culture, I'll, I'll rise to the level, level of that culture. But if, uh, but if someone comes in and says, Hey, you could be more, you could do more, you, you have the ability, then, then we rise to that. And I think there's a couple, there's a few lessons that I'm thinking in my head and I'm, I'm translating this even now as a parent, I've got three children, I've got a right. three-year-old, six-year-old, nine-year-old. And it's important to be encouraging for our kids and support our kids, but also be that light, be that light of, of opportunity and possibility. We don't want to set our kids up for failure, but we also want to say, hey, look, six-year-old, you're, you know, you're very competitive and uh, I'm going to push you to be in athletics more or Hey, look at you, nine-year-old. You're very creative. I'm going to push you to, you know, to, you know, to build things and create things and uh, and make things. And so, uh, you know, it becomes beholden upon us to identify the talents of of those we lead, and you know, even in in the jobs that we do, you know, and if we can identify the talents of those around us, we can inspire greatness in others, and then, <clears throat> at the same point in time, keep our ears open. Because if I was to look at the mirror when I was 16 years old, I would not have seen an Olympic champion. I wouldn't have even seen an Olympian. Mm -hmm. I would have seen some some average kid, you know, son of immigrants, you know, you know, barely, you know, just kind of getting by. And uh, I, I wouldn't have seen that. But uh, yeah. So you know, what, what you're saying to me is that we, and which, I, which is what I believe anyway, that we all have the ability to become exceptional. And as you're talking yes. about how, um, you know, you're growing up in a very average and ordinary town and you had these average and ordinary aspirations. Um, you, you know, the <clears throat> ABC Wild World of Sports uh, come back to mind. I'm going to tell two stories real quick on okay. that. Um, it, it, I didn't realize it had such an influence on me, but uh, back in 1979, which is the year I started running track, um, I was 15-ish, yeah, 15. Um, it was a year before the Moscow Olympics, and they had this series called Road to Moscow, and they hi highlighted the stories of Olympic athletes all around the world, different disciplines and so on. And, you know, of course, when we think of Olympians, we think of these superheroes. But what I was seeing in, in, and the thing that stood out to me the most in that series was how average and ordinary they were. That, you know, you and I are pretty average yeah. and ordinary guy, guys, mm -hmm. but we have this, we develop this extraordinary, these extraordinary dreams and then the mm -hmm. extraordinary um, desire uh, to go pursue them. And so you're right, you become exceptional. Uh, you're a, ju a judge to be exceptional when you do that. Um, but uh, so, so the second piece of the ABC stories, and, and actually when I think of your story, it, it, um, it, it seems to uh, epitomize this piece, right? They had this, this um, preview to their show, the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat, and there was a skier, you know, going off the side of the slope. Uh, in defeat as he crashed down the hill. Um, you know, so you won uh, the world championship in 2002, 2003. You're the favorite to win the Olympic golds in at Athens in 2004, and yet you finished fifth, which would yeah. be like the agony of defeat right, right there, right? But then you came back, 2007, you won the world championship, again, favorite to to win gold and you did it. So talk to us a little bit about that, Adam. Um, what one, what changed? Um, and two, I mean, what was it just that in 2004, you guys were, uh, you kind of succumbed to the pressure or was it something more fundamental? Did it have, have anything to do with the process? Um, you know, because what I know is that our success or failures or our results is usually a culmination of the process itself. Yeah. 
Well, there were things that we learned in Athens and Athens was, it was a crushing defeat. You know, we were, we finished in fifth place and uh, we knew that, you know, on an average day, we could have been on the podium and on a great day, we could have won gold and we weren't able to achieve any of our potential. We weren't able to achieve any of our expectations. Uh, and Beijing was very different. We won the Olympics. And, you know, one lesson I learned from that is just is the contrast between success and failure in that success and failure are two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, it, they're both endpoints and there's depression post failure and there's depression post success. And uh, really what I've learned in the process is that you need to pursue a goal that is in alignment with your values of what you truly care about uh, because the... Um, the end point is worth it. It is about the destination, you know, but it's also about the journey and staying aligned to the journey. What I learned about the failure in Athens, you know, and you're talking about preparation, what, uh, what showed up in the preparation, we lacked maturity. We lacked maturity and, um, and I want to say that hardness and focus and, and in retrospect you can you could see it happening leading up to Athens right it started in you know, we won the world championships in Seville 2002 and it was amazing it was the first time ever a Canadian men's eight had ever won the world championships so world history first time ever first you know first you know first ever mm -hmm. when we won we won by a signal like by both link but we were way up on on the competition the next year was tougher. We won by maybe you know half a half a deck. We it was a it was a close to race, but we won. It was hard hard fought, but we won. Mm -hmm. Then, um, you know, going into so you, you could climb to the top of the mountain, and on the other side of the mountain, when you're successful, if you want to be more successful, it's more work, right? Yep. It's a lot mm -hmm. of work to climb to the top of the mountain. And then you have to go back down and climb up to the next mountain. Yeah. And so you have to stay motivated to do the work and to, and to stay focused. And I started to notice it in, you know, our stroke man that fall, he had a, an existential crisis. He, um, he just decided that he didn't want to train anymore. He was one of the best rowers, if not the best rower in our, in our team. Mm -hmm. He had a bit of an emotional breakdown. He said, why am I doing this? I've, you know, I've been the best in the world twice going to the Olympics again. It's just doing the same thing. Right. And here I am. Um, and I've been like, I was really driven to get to the gold. And he had a bit of this gold medal syndrome where I got the gold and it didn't give me that sense of meaning and that sense of fulfillment that I thought it would give me. Right. So now that I've, I've won, I've been best in the world twice and I no longer feel I don't feel very different about myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, where is, <laughs> like, I'm not motivated. Yeah, what was and the so purpose? He, where's the joy? Yeah, where's the joy? Because uh, people think that, you know, that winning the Olympics, you know, having a you know, million dollars, sleeping with a ton of people, um, you know, being financially secure, having the family of your dreams, like having all this kind of stuff, they think that is going to, that's going to fulfill them in the end. But it's, it's, those are just means to fulfilling you know, the ends of what you truly want, that, that deeper right. level of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And so he was, he was going through this crisis of, of, uh, of not really valuing the journey and not valuing the destination, so he wasn't willing to put in the work. And so as he was going through this existential crisis, we were dealing with some other injuries in, uh, in the training center. We also had a lot of uh, competition. I'm not sure if you had this within your training group, uh, but we had we had a lot of rowers who were vying for seats in the boat. The mm -hmm. way that we would operate is that you know the boat wasn't completely set until six to eight weeks before the Olympics. Uh, we had we had a four uh, that was put together, and they won the world championships in 2003 as well in um, in mm -hmm. Milan. And, uh, and they started putting together this camp and, and politics started being created in our, in our training group. And so they started this, this program called um, 
Operation Destroy Confidence. And so they would do everything they could to undercut us um, psychologically um, and directly in conflict. Because when we'd, when we'd train, we'd always train in two person and one person boats. Mm -hmm. We'd always be racing against each other. So they were just, we were the target. When you're the top and you're the best, then you become the target. Right. And so there is, you know, there were politics that were in, infiltrating. Uh, we were being targeted. There was a, um, you know, an existential crisis of, you know, I'm the best in the world and it's not making me feel any better about myself. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would. Uh, and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to be an Olympic champion. And so there's a lot of doubt and, um, you know, and, and unease in the year leading up to, to the Olympics. And then finally, when we got to the Olympic race course, we, we ra raced the heat and uh, the Americans beat us. You know, we, we broke, it's funny, because we, in the heat in Athens, we set the world record time. We went mm -hmm. the fastest that anyone had ever gone in a rowboat before. And then the Americans beat us by that much. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> and so we go into the repechage, and then in the repechage, at the, the race is 2,000 meters long, and around 1,100, 1,200 into it, our stroke seat, the same guy who had the existential crisis, the right. crisis of meaning, was like, should I be training? Should I not be? Uh, injured himself. He injured his pectoral muscle. Right. And so <clears throat> it was labored. We, we won the repechage, got into the final. And so we had an injury in the boat, and we were wondering what we should do. And, you know, and this speaks to even just maturity of, of a crew and ability to share leadership, uh, you know, and give influence to one another. We were sitting around with our coach and our coach was a little British man. You know, he'd say, he'd say things like, oh, oh, Devon, oh, <laughs> friendships, they come and go, Devon. Right. But gold medals, they last forever. <laughs> <laughs> you could say funny things like that. But we were sitting around and he was very much about giving onus to the crew. And he said, I want you as a crew to win the gold medal. It's not me, the coach, it's you. Mm -hmm. And so after the injury happened, we sat around and it was one of these, you've been to Olympic villages, one of these like dead, newly built rooms. Right. You know, and there's still plaster on the wall and we have these folding chairs. We're sitting around, we're looking at each other. He's like, okay, uh, Jeff Powell is injured. And the medical staff say that he should be okay. What do you think? And we're looking around and nobody's saying anything. Everyone's just sitting there terrified. Um, uh, they weren't willing to share anything. And I, I can't say what anyone else was thinking. Um, I could sense what they were feeling, but I know what I was thinking because I sat right behind uh, Jeff in, uh, who was in the, the stroke seat. And I remember seeing mm -hmm. his, like he had, he had a beautiful stroke, like best stroke I've ever seen of anyone really. Um, and his, his, his catch where he put the, the blade in the water was always super sharp. It was like, it was so fast and sharp and, mm -hmm. and it set up the boat and everyone could follow it. But after his injury, it was just, it was like, yeah. it was, it was right. soft, mm -hmm. soft. And so, I didn't say anything. I didn't say, oh, Jeff's stroke looks soft. Another thing I was thinking, why don't, how about you put me, the, the other thing I was thinking, why don't put me in the stroke seat? Mm -hmm. Maybe I should go in the stroke seat, put <clears throat> Jeff further in the back, or maybe we get one of our spares, put him in the boat. Like, why don't we switch up the order? And that, I mean, that'll shake it up. And, you know, I can drive it from, you know, from the stroke seat. But I didn't say that. I just sat there. And I think the, whether it was better for me to like Jeff to be out of the boat or into the boat or me to be in stroke seat or not be in the stroke seat. I don't think it is, you know, I don't know if any of those answers were right, but what I do know is wrong. It was wrong for me not to speak up. Mm -hmm. It was wrong for me not to say anything. It was wrong for me to sit there in fear. And that was the difference between Athens and Beijing. I'd say that was the big, big difference, you know, and so it sounds to know. me then, uh, Adam, that, you know, all the way through, you know, camp when the, all this rivalry and the politicking was going on into the Olympic Games, there were telltale signs that you guys ignored. And then we, we just spoke about the coronavirus, but I think we also pointed out that it's not just about the coronavirus itself, it's crisis in our lives. And so when mm -hmm. you had 
the crisis of a guy on the boat getting injured, nobody did anything to adapt to this mm -hmm. new normal. Yeah. Yeah. And it's to be proactive. It's to have conversations and it's to, to speak, speak your mind and speak your heart and, and be open when you, when you are speaking, you know, because Sometimes you just need to process something, process, uh, process an idea or mm -hmm. process a deep seated feeling uh, uh, to gain more alignment as to what needs to happen and uh, internalizing it, you know, internalizing it can be very difficult. Uh, and we need to have, there's this, there's a woman by the name of Amy Edmondson and she writes a lot about psychologically safe teams. So if you're on a psychologically safe team, it means that you can speak your mind, but you, it comes with the, the, you know, the presupposition that uh, what I say might not be correct and it might not be uh, right, yet mm -hmm. it's safe for me to share this idea and I'm not instantly gonna be shot down. And, and right. you, Devin, aren't gonna say, Creek, you're an idiot because you, you're, you're saying this thing. Instead, you're like, mm -hmm. well, let's, let's explore this more. And maybe this is right, maybe this is not. And if I fail, I'm not gonna be shamed. I'm not gonna be pushed into taboo. Instead, we're gonna use it as, as an opportunity to learn and grow. We're gonna assume that you, know, that you have the best intentions, I have the best intentions. Right. We're, we're all in this together. And so I think this is, you know, it's really easy for us to devolve into these survivalistic instincts and put up our barriers. But, um, you know, and we didn't, we didn't have a psychologically safe team in 2004. Yeah. And in 2008, we did. We, right. like, there was, and this is true, by the um, way, Adam, whether we're talking about a rowing team or a, a business team or a mm -hmm. marriage or a friendship, correct? Yes. 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 So very true. Yeah. So, so you spoke about the fact that, um, you know, after your failure in Athens, Athens, right. Um, you know, you, you bald like a baby, right. And oh. you know, but, <laughs> well, no, I'm bald like an old man now. You're bald. A double take right there. Right. Yeah. And so on, so man, but that's sports. Why, why are you crying? You know, but, you know, the way I look at it is after you have invested yourself so heavily, so personally into achieving a particular result, you, you feel pretty crappy when you don't get that result, right? You look mm -hmm. at professional sports and these guys, you know, they have enough money to buy a, a, a warehouse full of trophies and they're balling because mm -hmm. they lost that one little trophy. Um, yes. You know, so you feel poop badly, you feel badly when you're, business sink when your marriage fail um how do, how do you how do we make that transition or how do we prepare ourselves adam to make that transition from the initial shock of the failure to become what you describe as a happy failure to a happy failure well there's a process i learned in athens and it was actually i was i'm working through uh, I'm coaching one individual right now and he just lost his job. He's worked in the radio industry for 30 years, just got let go. And he said, as soon as he was let go, he just, he didn't know what to do. He's in his fifties. Uh, everything felt like uh, I don't have revenues. I, what am I going to do? Got depressed. Couldn't, you know, leave his bed for a month and it's just trying to, trying to get the energy back so that he can start taking positive steps forward and, um, you know, and do the next thing, right? Your life isn't over. we got to do the next thing. But if, if there's too much emotional blockage inside, then that, that creates this strong internal resistance for inside of us for moving forward. Right. And that's what I felt even after Athens, after Athens, I had, I had so much shame and guilt, uh, and, and unprocessed emotion and feelings around that race that, um, yeah, I, I, I had to go through a process of, of letting it go. And it was a, it's a three-step process of reflecting, learning, and growing. And the first step, I think, is the most important, which is emotionally processing. The mm. second step is intellectually processing, like, you know, we did the intellectual processing. Oh, we need more shared leadership. We, uh, we, we needed more psychologically safe conversations. Uh, we needed to be more mature. Uh, there's a lot of things that we could have done intellectually process. And then you create new habits. Say, okay, these are the habits and process, you know, um, 
principles, policies, procedures that I've established. But the first step, emotional processing is the most important. And you know, it was the same for me as an athlete, the same as this guy who just got his job, who left his job. I worked with another guy who built up um, you know, a giant uh, real estate uh, corporation. It, he lost his money, his parents' money, his in-laws' money, his investors' money. So that felt like that's mm -hmm. a failure. But yeah. it's, you know, the only true end line in life is death. He's not dead. He had to get through it. So how do you process these failures, whether it be losing a job, losing people's income, losing a marriage, dealing with a, a, you know, an addiction or, or some sort of mess up, you know, losing a big, big athletic race where you've ascribed a lot of identity and value to it. And the emotional processing I learned first about it's almost like a primal. Have you ever tried primal scream therapy? No. Uh, no. Have you ever heard of it? No. First time. Actually. No. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so the idea is that you, like, you go out in nature where, like, where there's nobody around you because right. they'll think you're crazy if you try this, <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then you you access this like the animal part of your brain right right, right. back here, and you just you scream with rage. You just go. Right. Rah! Uh, and I'm not going to scream to yeah to, exactly like like, ah, like you scream, and I I learned about this when it was two years after the after the Beijing Olympics. I was going through Toastmasters training to be a better speaker, mm -hmm. and there was a woman in my club. She was in her mid forties, and she was experiencing a lot of emotional turmoil. And she said, you know, when I was young, when I was a teenage girl, you know, I was I was physically abused, I was sexually abused you know, by, uh, you know, I think by her uncle or someone, you know, close to her. And she said it was really traumatic at that time. But then in my twenties, I went through therapy. I went through and I, I felt like I dealt with all of that. And then I, I got married. I had a family, I have kids and I feel like I'm like moving on. And then for some reason, in my forties, it's coming back and I'm having, I can't separate the facts from the feelings of my life. So her solution was to go to a racquetball court. And so she'd go to a racquetball court and she'd pick up this racket and she'd take the ball and she'd hit it and scream. And every time she hit right. it, she'd go, bah! Right. Bah! Bah! kind of thing. And she said she did this like two or three times a week for about six weeks. And then eventually she got into, and you know, she set aside time to just get animal and process and, and scream. And, uh, she said at the end of six weeks, she picked up the ball one time to hit it and hmm. nothing. Nothing. She said, oh, okay, well, it's gone now. Right. Yeah. And so she like processed it and let it go. Right. And I know of another guy. I've got a friend. He runs a, a you know, a, a condo group. He was like, he was physically, uh, again, same kind of thing, physically sexually abused as a kid. Uh, he, he'll go out to the wilderness and um, he's like this little Filipino guy. So if you can picture that, he's just going out ah, ah, mm. and same sort of th just screaming, hitting things. And then it's gone. Mm -hmm. And then the, you know, the, and I've, the other thing that's, that's also worked for me besides primal mm -hmm. scream is just aerobic, aerobic work. Like I'll go on and, and I'll go on a long bike ride and I'll get like an hour into it. And all of a sudden, like I'll just start crying spontaneously. And it's a really weird experience because you're, you're thinking and you've kind of, you've gotten away from, you know, the interactive conversational right. space. Mm -hmm. You're in, you're in your own space, you're moving. And all of a sudden something comes up like some, you know, your body holds onto feelings that your brain can't process even. Mm -hmm. And so and is like, it that then, you know, when we go through these failures and it, it becomes a blockage in, in a way it's because mm -hmm. we, just haven't dealt with it emotionally. We're, we're kind of yeah. holding on to it out of shame or guilt. Well, shame or guilt, and we're trying to describe it logically, but this is like our, when our body holds on to, to negative feelings and negative emotions, um, it's not logical. It's mm -hmm. something that's, that's deeply physical. And our, yeah, our body can, you know, it can hold on to failures and it can hold on to, to trauma. Um, and it takes it takes a lot of work to to release that that deep trauma uh, so that we can 
you know, get rid of that resistance and go, get to the other side. And again, realize, like we were saying, realize that each of us has greatness inside of us. And yeah. we, have, we have a journey that we're going towards and start taking steps in positive directions. And It's it, part of the challenge, Adam, the fact that we often see ourselves as failures as opposed to the results that we got as, you know, falling short yeah. of the mark. Oh, I agree. Right. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, because it's right. It, there's a difference between saying I have failed and I am a failure. Yeah. That's, those are two very different things. You know, just like, and just because you went, and you took the bobsled and it tilted over and it scraped down the, the side. Doesn't it mean that you're me. a failure. It was, no. <laughs> it was him. He's the failure. I happened to be there, but it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> but no. that, like that means nothing, right? It's yeah. okay. I'm. I had an experience where, you know, I experienced a failure, and that's that's a very different. Uh, statement than I am a failure because when you say I am a failure you're not separating facts from feelings right? yeah. you, you are mm -hmm. feeling the failure so deeply and it, it's you and need it to so intertwined with the results as well um, mm -hmm. you know when I like after 80 when I became a bobsled driver and there yeah you, you are going to crash and there were times when I was just, I just look at the sled at the end of the truck and I'm so upset with it. I'm like, you know what? We're going back to the top and we're doing this again, right? Yeah. But because I it was able to separate my, it, I made a mistake. I know that. But like, how dare you crash, sled? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're we're going to, and that's, uh, you know, the, the challenge is when we invest ourselves so heavily, it, it's, I can see how it can be easy to see ourselves as failures as opposed to just seeing the result as a failure. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I think we, like I said, it's important for us to process it emotionally as well as intellectually and create a new habit uh, so that we can let it go. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about risk. So you, you spoke about the fact that um, your, your coach saw, uh, the potential in you, right? And you, you, you got into rowing. Um, what inspired you, though, to take on this risk of um, rowing across the Atlantic? Um, and how do you, obviously, it's a risky journey. How do you mitigate for the risk of, of taking on such an adventure? Yeah, well, I think there's, well, when you first... I'm going to talk about a different risk first, if you don't mm. mind, because the I remember when my my coach in high school said you could be an Olympian, there was a risk there, and that terrified me because there's the risk of saying that I want to do this, I want to go to the Olympics, I want to be on the national team, and if I say that and I don't do that, what does that mean to me? Mm -hmm. And I it I didn't tell anyone that I had an Olympic dream until. I was almost there to be clear with you. Cause I was scared. I was scared right. of the risk of, of not making it. I was scared of the risk of, of not actually, and what would that do to my psychology, especially as, you know, as a young man, I was, if I say I want to do this and I don't do that, what, what does that mean? And so there's, there's the risk of when we set a goal and we're too verbal about it and vocal about it. If I don't do it, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, and then I guess moving to rowing across the ocean, that seemed, I guess, you know, I was older when I set that goal. And to me, it just seemed like a knowledge problem, you know, to, to gain a sense of if, you know, if I was to do, you know, just look into the math and the statistics, it's, it's safer to row across an ocean than it is to ride a motorbike. Mm. Yeah, and I think most if of us. You, know if you look at it that way, sure, but yeah. that's not logical. That's not how people, <laughs> it, right? No. Well, and the ocean's big. You know, there's big. I'm not a very good swimmer. You know, I'm I'm a good sinker. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something we have in common. <laughs> so, you know, here we are. On, you're on a rowboat, and uh, you're in big waves. 
and so it started out by one understanding what all the risks were writing them down uh, qualifying each of the risks uh, you know, figuring out how probable is is it that something will happen what is the impact that that thing will have on on the event and then training at the end of the day so we started I, one I had uh, an experienced captain on our boat Jordan Hansen as a wonderful individual he had rowed across the ocean once before we started out going we did like a little row. The first row I did in the ocean was uh, in the Puget Sound off of Washington State. And we rode around this island called Vashon Island. Took a day, there was not many waves, it was sheltered. Mm -hmm. And then we went and we did emergency life raft training up in Anacortes, Washington. These guys who train Navy, fishermen. Uh, and then after that, we went off the west coast of Washington, went out into some big waves, got beaten around a bit in our boat got a sense of okay this is the ocean you know mother ocean she's you know she's out there and then after that we circumnavigated Vancouver Island uh, and that took 24 days we got into some big waters got pushed around got caught in currents and you know fog and uh, you know, dealt with some uh, pretty big winds and so got a good sense of, of the boat the vessel how it handled and then when it finally came time to launch you know from from Senegal and go across the ocean we'd we'd had the experience we'd analyzed the risks we'd gone through worst case scenario and we knew that you know in the worst case scenario we could be you know we would be safe mm -hmm. and we actually we got pretty close to the worst case scenario when we capsized in the Bermuda Triangle and yeah, I'm exactly like, and so, you know, it, it seems to me that before I get to, to, to the capsizing that, you know, whatever the goal is, there's always going to be a risk, uh, in, whether it's just, you know, a, a, an aspirational goal of competing in the Olympic Games, uh, where you're relatively safe in, in terms of your life or, or, you know, sailing across the ocean or starting a business or maybe pursuing a college degree after or, or switching yeah. jobs. There's always mm -hmm. these, um, these risks, there's, there's situations that are uncomfortable, but if you uh, take the time to identify the goal, you can, and figure out the steps, you can mitigate the danger, so to speak. Exactly, and it's, it's reminding yourself that you, are, that you are safe. And it's another, it reminds me of like my, I'm just thinking about my wife right now, when mm -hmm. she's, when we had three kids and she was like, when she was going to have her first kid, she was terrified about pushing a baby out. And she's mm -hmm. like, it's going to be really terrifying. It's going to be really painful. I don't know what it's going to be like. But the, what she kept saying in her head was like, millions of women have pushed out a baby before me, and I'm going to do it. And then millions of women are going to do it after me. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm going to be okay. Right. And I think the same sort of phrasing that if we're changing a job if we're setting a goal to go to the olympics if we're rowing across the ocean like people have done this before you know i'm you know i'm not you know i'm not doing something for the first time ever you know mm -hmm. we all stand on the shoulders of giants we have you know we're an incredible species and we can learn from one another really effectively mm -hmm. i'm i'm not the first one to do this Agreed. So, if they have done it, therefore I can do it as well, right? <clears throat> exactly. And so, and then it comes down to, I have another friend who is, he was an Olympic swimmer and his question he'd always asked himself is why not me? So if people have done it before, and if I'm going to go to the Olympics, someone has to win the Olympic gold medal. Why not me? Why not you? I agree. You know, I agree. And if, Right. If someone has to row across the Atlantic Ocean, you know, why not me? Someone has to start this business and make some money. There's got to be someone who's going to be a millionaire. There's got to be, you know, you know, billionaires in this world. Why, why not me? <clears throat> why not me? How, how does that jive with um, the the idea, the philosophy of self leadership, Adam? Well, self leadership, it's you know, it's circling back to I can I can control what I can control. You know, I can control my response to a situation and I can control my reaction to a situation <clears throat> and self leadership is, is about, it comes down, it comes down to values. Uh, I think it's mm -hmm. it, what is, what is a goal that you truly value? 
And, and we saw that. We saw the, the, the crisis in my stroke seat leading to Athens. He thought that he valued this goal. And when he got it, he was empty. I call right. that gold medal syndrome. Mm -hmm. So self-leadership is about understanding that you're going towards a goal that is truly valuable to you. And you're on a journey that's delivering value. So it's all about the destination and the journey or the destination and, and the journey. And, you know, when it talks about self-leadership, it's when you have an issue and when you have a blockage, self-leadership is about influencing yourself to get over that blockage. So mm -hmm. I'm stuck. What am I going to do? You know what? I'm having trouble. I'm going to pick up the phone. I'm going to say, hey, Devin, I have a problem that I think you can help me solve you know, I read your book and, you know, I, I saw in there that you, you have, you have an insight that I don't think I completely grasp. So I'm going to ask you and I'm going to figure out how can I, you know, how can I learn from this to get to the next step? Yeah. And so self-leadership is about taking onus on yourself when you do have a problem to step up and look for a solutions, have a solutions mindset. And you know, we're all, motivation goes in waves. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes we feel like we can do it. Other times we don't. And self-leadership shows its strength when we don't feel like we can do it. Mm -hmm. It's about. So we're talking about <clears throat> in terms of self-leadership. One is getting ourselves through the journey, but making sure that that journey is so aligned with our values that when we get to the quote unquote destination, it's something that we want. Like, you know, Stephen Covey speaks mm -hmm. about making sure that when we put the, we get to the top of the ladder, the ladder is on the correct wall, correct? The right Yes, <laughs> I, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great analogy. Yeah. yeah. Making sure we put our ladder on the right wall. Yeah. And uh, otherwise you've, you'd have done all this work and, and I guess led yourself through a process that wasn't, really in sync with who you truly are deep down. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's, this is the gift of success and this is the gift of failure too. You know, the older we get, the more successes and the more failures we rack up and we can see the successes that make us happy and the successes that make us sad. Mm -hmm. And um, when we notice that there are, there's something missing in you know, the successes that make us sad, that's where va there's certain values that we have that aren't being expressed. And the successes that make us happy are values being expressed. And sometimes we fail, right? We fail and you get to the end. I'm actually really happy at the end. I didn't, I set out, for example, I set out to row across the ocean. We capsized in the Bermuda Triangle. It was, right. you know, it was, you know, terrifying and disappointing because we didn't get there. But then pretty quickly it turned into something that was, I'm so glad this happened. Like this was, this was wonderful. It didn't mm -hmm. work out the way that I imagined it or planned it or hoped it yet. I was on a values aligned journey to a values aligned destination. And even though the destination changed, there's, it's still aligned with my values. And um, that's like, that's what keeps us going. So uh, going through that process of, of thinking back, to the things that didn't work out, but feel like they worked out really well. Mm -hmm. You're understanding that you're more able to be more you. And that's at the end of the day, that's the, like, that's the goal of life. It's like, how that's can that, Devin yeah, So that's, that's a happy Devin. failure coming out. Right. Um, yeah. So let's, let's, let's kind of dovetail back to the whole business of the responsibility ethic and, you know, you, you, in your book, you talk about the 12 strategies, exceptional people, use to do the work to create the to make you know success happen um what we're talking about here like the the the, the capsizing of the boat in the bermuda triangle and maybe next time you want to row around the triangle because i hear there's yeah. <laughs> bad stuff that happened inside the triangle <laughs> well, we wanted to go to miami you know? ah see? see you in miami well fly dude <laughs> Trap velocity, <laughs> but um, <laughs> how 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 we talk about you know holding ourselves accountable for our outcomes, right? Yeah. How does um, you know be, 
holding yourself accountable to, to our out, for our outcomes jive with this business of being a, a, a happy failure? And how does that impact, you know, not just sailing across the ocean, but again, the other aspects of our lives that mere mortals, you know, participating, marriages and businesses and yeah. relationships. Yeah, so talk about marriage and business as, you know, what is, what is your outcome that you want to identify for your business? And what is the outcome you want to identify for a marriage? You know, for a marriage, you want to, I, you want a perfect marriage, you're staying together and you're happy and you're loving and you're supportive and uh, you help each other through the down times and you have a lot of good times. You know, through a business, you're making money. Um, when I think of the, you know, the entrepreneurs that I coach, they like some of them want to build a community and leave an impact. You know, and so you have to. They want to provide. Uh, they want to provide income and support for the people they employ. Uh, they're motivated by uh, higher values of you know, either changing the environment, changing uh, the economy. Uh, they're healing people. They're providing resources. So we have these, these end goals uh, that we're going towards. And if we can feel like we're making progress towards those, you know, to, um, you know, even in the face of failure, you know, you have, you know, the coronavirus and oil tanks, or oil stocks tanking, mm -hmm. You know, even through these points of, of crisis where you can't make payroll and then you're, um, you, you're can't struggling. Can't pay the bills. With, can't, can't pay, pay the, the bills. bills. Yeah. Yeah. And you have, you have all this stress and it feels uh, it's, it's super stressful. And there's people knocking on your door saying, you know, I need, you know, I need to pay up. If you can remind yourself of what you truly do value in life, um, it can give you the strength to continue. And I think that's the, when we talk about the happy failure, we like, we need to, you know, we need to be pursuing things that really, that really light us up and kind of treat, you know, even like treat our, our, our business or our job or our marriage as a discipline that gets us to, you know, to our more authentic self and our more true self. Mm. And I think of what I talk about even in, I think it's chapter two, I talk about the difference between toxic goals and fantastic goals. So the fantastic four and the toxic three goals. And toxic three goals are, uh, are wealth, You're saying, oh, everything will be all, all right if I'm just, if I'm rich and I have all the money. In the right. Room. And when you're in financial stress, it's real, it hurts. It's, uh, you know, I've been in it myself it's not fun to mm -hmm. like you know to be trying to pay the bills um the but you know just pursuing wealth pursuing beauty or sex saying if i'm more beautiful or if i'm having sex with more people everything's going to be way way better mm -hmm. uh, but it's not and the final one is status and fame if everyone could just recognize me or if i could have my status in my organization if i was just the boss if i was the president everything would be better and so i find when people pursue these goals you know wealth status beauty uh, they um they end up being sicker they have more disease uh they're more likely to be addicted to substances that are harmful and they're more likely to um you know harm the the environment but the mm -hmm. fantastic four, if we if we're pursuing these types of goals, if we're pursuing goals that are, you know, how do I create more community value? That's one. So how do I give back to the community, either through mm -hmm. my business or through volunteering, through my church? Uh, how do I deliver more community value? That's one. If you deliver the more and more community value you give, the, the happier you will feel. Yeah. Um, the next one is personal health and well-being. So <laughs> do I have health and well-being goals? So you know, going for a walk more often, you know, right. having a healthier diet. Like that's, that's another one. Um, building authentic relationships is a third one. So am I building real relationships, relationships where you can have real conversations about real things, not just surface conversations. And I'm pretending, you know how everyone has these layers of the onion. I'm yes. Like, uh -huh. you know, got my layer. Can I, can I have relationships where I'm actually at the core of the onion? And Precisely. 
having real conversations. And the last one, what do we have? Community, uh, health and wellness, authentic relationships and uh, self-actualization. So uh, learning more about who you are, you know, how can Devin be more Devin? How can Adam be more Adam? Right. And can I, can I embrace some kind of spiritual practice or self-development, personal development that will allow me to understand who I am? Uh, like I, I talked about values, for example, can, can I understand what my values are and, and, you know, align my life more effectively with that? Yeah. Or can I, embrace prayer or meditation or uh, something like that that gives me allows me to be in a more alignment with my true self because that also to go back to the point you were making earlier adam i think separates you from the results especially the the, the failure results the ones that you don't want and to use a word you use earlier it makes you more resilient mm-hmm well, and it's, you know, to a certain extent, they can exist as these cluster benefits. So you have the big goal. You know, I have the goal of going to the Olympics. I have the goal of running across the ocean. I have the goal of making a marriage survive. I have the goal of, of making a profitable business. But underneath, there is this cluster of benefits that are actually uh, more important, and you're achieving them along the way. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm building authentic relationships. I'm uh, delivering community value. I'm building leadership skills. I'm understanding more about myself. I'm, uh, I'm able to, um, you know, gain more understanding about the world around me. And as these, as we identify more and more of these cluster benefits that are actually truly valuable and meaningful to us that are motivated by this higher goal, right. then, then the goal becomes an excuse for actually getting the things we because truly you're getting want. all of these smaller, you know, this class of benefits is smaller. You're hitting all these smaller points that are making mm -hmm. you feel awesome on your way to getting this big thing. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. you're more likely to stay on the track to get the big thing. Yeah. You know, and if you don't get the big thing, you got all the stuff you wanted anyways. Exactly. So, so two, two, I want to touch on two quick points before we close Adam. One is the whole business of we're talking about goals. You know, anybody who has read the literature on goal setting knows about smart goals, but you advocate uh, clear goals. Uh, talk yes. us through that a little bit, if you could. Okay, so clear goals, it's an acronym. So each letter represents a different uh, word that should stimulate our mind on how we should set our goals. Smart goals are great because they access our higher function. They access our mm -hmm. prefrontal cortex. They were first written about 1978 to help people think through their goals uh, in a smarter fashion. But what they fail to do is fail to access the emotional intelligence that all of us have innately. Mm -hmm. So what clear goals does, it's, it's, it incorporates the information from smart goals, but um, also incorporates emotional intelligence. The five letters of clear is C is collaborative. Who are you doing this with? L is limited. What are the limits associated with this goal? How are people who are not you? Uh, how will they know that you've achieved this goal? Mm -hmm. um, e is emotional, accessing your personal why and the why of the people you're serving. You know, why should I achieve this goal? Why do other people want me to achieve mm -hmm. this goal? A is appreciable, which is growing over time. Like I, am, I have an investment. It appreciates over time. It grows over time. So how can I take this big goal and break it down into small little steps that go step, 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 step mm -hmm. into that big goal? And the final one is refinable. Uh, so uh, understanding what, uh, yeah, understanding uh, the worst case scenario, the most likely scenario, and the absolute, absolute best case scenario, and defining that spread, right. as well as uh, understanding what will change. What will change if I all of a sudden have to change this goal around? Um, so clear goal setting is, um, you know, it, it's, it's quite effective. Yeah. So if I have, let's walk through a goal. What was a goal that one of your listeners might have? What would a simple goal be that one of your listeners? Would um, you know, to have a successful business. So, okay, to have a successful business. So I've got, <clears throat> you know, I'm running a business, and so I have, so I've got, I'm going to pick a random business out of my head. 
So I've got a cleaning business. I go into right. office buildings after everything, everyone shut off the lights and I go and I, I clean these office buildings and I'm starting to build up some staff. I've got you know, 20 employees and it's great. It's uh, you know, semi lucrative and right. I'm, I'm building my business. So what's, you know, I have to figure out what my big goal is. So my big goal, I now have 20 office buildings. My big goal is 200 office buildings. Mm -hmm. I'm going to 10 X my business. Right. So that's my, it starts out. I have my big goal. I need 200 office buildings that I'm going to service great revenues. So C collaborative, who am I going to work with? Well, first off, I'm going to have to hire enough employees to make sure that I'm cleaning the buildings. Uh, I'm going to have to have managers because I'm not going to be able to manage all those employees. Mm -hmm. when I move from uh, 20 buildings to 200. Um, I'm going to have to, you know, increase my accounting. So I'm going to need a better uh, accounting, some business right. services, uh, marketing. I have, have to get a guy who rides uh, his uh, bike uh, from home to work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're going to have to get a biking accountant, right. <laughs> you know, marketing. Um, I'm also going to need uh, support from, you know, from my wife, from my family, because mm -hmm. as, as they're part of the team, they're part of the collaboration. Yeah, yeah I need to get their buy-in because uh, when everything's growing, I might be working 12, 14 hour days. And so starting to say, okay, these are the collaborative. So limited, let's, mm -hmm. let's make sure I'm more specific with, with this goal. So, so, you know, 200 office buildings, you know, might mean, um, you know, a million dollars a year in revenue. So let's write that down. I'm going to have a million dollars right. a year in revenue. And so if I have a million dollars a year in revenue, um, you know, that also means that I have a payroll of, uh, you know, 700,000 mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, supplies of a hundred thousand, you know, profits of 200,000 for right. me. Wow. That's great business. Um, you know, what is my, what are my geographical limits? I'm only going to stay in exactly. the town of mm -hmm. Buffalo, or maybe I'm going to go, you know, all across. New York state, mm -hmm. or I'm going to go all across America, or maybe I'll be international clean the office buildings in Kingston, Jamaica as well. <laughs> and, and Toronto, Ontario. I don't know. There you go. <laughs> and so defining the limits, you know, making sure that there's specific, measurable, you know, realistic time bound and by when I'm going to do this in five years and then emotional. Why do I want to do this? Why? Well, I want to keep buildings clean because, you know, I'm deeply affected by the coronavirus and I want to make sure people yeah. don't get sick. Um, Precisely. I want to clean this buildings because I, I care about my family. I want to provide for them. I want to show my children that um, I can create this. I want to be a great role model for them. You know, why would other people want me to succeed? They want clean buildings. They want, um, you know, uh, people need to want to show up and, uh, and feel like they've got a great place to work and feel safe mm -hmm. and secure. And then appreciable, I'm going to break it down over time. I've got 20 buildings. So then in a month, I'm going to have, you know, 21. And then I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to hire growing another right. staff. And so I'm going to figure out how like the sales staff and how is this going to grow and so break it down so over four years how will that grow and then finally worst case most likely case best case in the refinable stage so absolutely worst case scenario um, I, um, I'm working really hard and I start losing clients and well that's that's the probably not the worst. Comes in and people are working yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. my contracts get, and so now I'm back to instead of having staff, it's just me with a couple small contracts, and I'm, yeah. you know, I'm still only making forty thousand dollars a year instead of my dream of two hundred and fifty thousand a year. So most likely case, I'm going to slowly build over time, and I'm going to get to, um, say, my two hundred buildings that I think is is a stretch, but a most likely case of what I can do. Best best case scenario. Things start taking off. I find an X factor, and all of a sudden, I have two thousand buildings, and I'm having different headache. And so then I start imagining what it would be like to have two thousand buildings, and how would I deal with that problem of, mm -hmm. of managing all these? And uh, and so making sure there's distance between worst case, best case, and most likely case scenario, and and that's basically the clear goal setting methodology. Going through each of those. Um, it helps you um, helps you get a better sense of the future and actually make the future happen. Indeed, and you, you um, when you're talking about uh, the team's failure in Athens, and you know you're all sitting on folding chairs in a little room, uh, kind of in a circular firing squad, 
um, you mentioned the term shared leadership. Um, mm -hmm. So we spoke about self-leadership. Dive a little bit into shared leadership, if you could. So shared leadership is more like a jazz band and less like an orchestra. Mm -hmm. Now, in an orchestra, you have the conductor who says, do, 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 violins do this, tubas do that, right. and piccolo <clears throat> does this. Whereas in a jazz band, you know, I'm playing the trumpet, you're playing the bass guitar, Jimmy's playing the drums, and all of a sudden, Jimmy's motivated to do the drum solo, and we look at him, it's mm -hmm. like, oh, Jimmy's going. So we step back, and we let Jimmy go, and Jimmy's done, and then all of a sudden, you come out, and you do your bass solo, and then mm -hmm. we all watch you, it's like, oh, Devin's going. And then I moved and I'm going to do the trumpet and I'm blow and I do my trumpet Good thing. thing. Right. Yeah. And everyone's, everyone's hyper aware of what the other ones are doing. And when the spirit moves them, they step up and they're able to, to influence, influence the group. And so shared leadership works and very well. And they don't well. feel that they're stepping on other people's toes. They don't, they feel welcome, so to speak, to step mm -hmm. up when the spirit moves. Yes, when the spirit moves, it's very psychologically safe. Right. When mm -hmm. someone steps up, there's, everyone's very aware. There's a lot of trust, uh, support, encouragement. There is, yeah, you need, you need deep, deep level trust between everyone. And it's, it works well in a small group, you know, you know, mm -hmm. five, eight, ten people, uh, and you can get a lot done, and you can be very resilient and very effective when you have a group that is that is set up like that. And so, sharing leadership works well from uh, for executive teams, uh, for small teams, and it, uh, you know, again, it's about making sure communication is flowing. I was flowing. about to say, I can see yeah. how important, you know communication is obvious it's always an important thing but especially in a shared leadership environment mm -hmm. communicating always learning um you know from the other people that you're working with yeah and the communication is obviously it's verbal but it can also be um non-verbal non-verbal communication so i'm looking at you i'm looking at your face and uh, and how you're reacting and i'm mm -hmm. trying to read how you're communicating without words and they're trying to sense you and and have that you know that non nonverbal connection and that's yeah. that's where shared leadership really becomes magical is when we have a nonverbal connection and th that trust that transcends the words that we use indeed indeed and allows us to make things happen uh, make success happen adam um how, how do we find you, man? And I know you probably won't be doing too much traveling right now <laughs> at the keynotes, but uh, you know, people who want coaching, people who want your book, you know, the responsible, responsibility ethic. How, how do yeah. we Well, first you Google. Have you heard of this thing called the internet, Devin? <laughs> is, that, is that a new thing? What's going on? So the, um, I'm on Amazon and... Uh, chapters and you know all of these things uh i will be on Audible way, for, soon. For non canadians uh you know chapters is a bookstore right yes yeah yes. chapters yeah. Us <laughs> yeah indigo is indigo that's still America? canadian you have to come down to uh, nobles here, man. nobles yeah just go go to any your favorite bookstore and ask yeah. for it you know online it's on amazon uh there'll be an auto you know audio book by June at the latest. I just look at the calendar. So, and yeah. I'm on LinkedIn. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, that's where I'm most active. I also have a website, uh, creekspeak.com. That's K R E E K S P E A K. But uh, if you just Google the responsibility ethic, Adam Creek, you'll be able to find me. I'm on Twitter. I don't know. I'm, I'm relatively accessible. All right. Uh, Friendly. I, I uh, pride myself as being the easiest guy to find. It seems like you're I yeah. have competition, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's you're hungry. Yeah, hungry. I guess so. I keep working. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good, man. You know, Adam, thank you so much, dude, for spending time with us, sharing, uh, you know, your experiences as a rower. I mean, uh, you know, I you're in water sport, and I'm in water sport as well. Just I like my water frozen, though. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> love that. So it's, it's pretty cool to be able to connect with another water sport athlete and, and a speaker and an author. So we seems to be, seem to be going on the same road. Thank you for uh, putting in the effort to write this and sharing your wisdom and experiences with us. And of course, for being on the show to, to kind of condense it. So thanks once again for being on Keep On Pushing. Yeah, well, thank you, Devin, and all the best. Yeah, man, let's, let's, let's do that. Let's, let's, let's keep on pushing. Thanks again. Yeah. Thanks for watching. If you haven't done so yet, make sure you click on that subscribe button and hit that bell. You'll get a notification every time we post a new video. And don't forget, share it with your friends, man. They want to be inspired as well, right? So share it. Don't keep it. And before you go on to the next video, visit my website, www.devonharris.com Keep on pushing.